So our next legend for this morning is Don Mackay. And Don Mackay has been for many years at Trent University in Canada. Some of you probably know him well. Um, Don is internationally recognized for models that he created to predict the fate and effects of chemicals in the environment. And these models are widely used by the EPA, I know, and other institutions around the world. Don is also known for his research in, in the Great Lakes for Great Lakes water quality and also Arctic conditions. And in fact, just a um, funny little story is when we were trying to contact him, Vic and I were trying to contact him to be um, one of our legends in this symposium, he was out on a large ship off the coast of Antarctica <laughs> and actually did get our, our phone call, which is amazing. So, um, so welcome Don Mackay. of this is very humbling and gratifying to be on the same page as some of the legends. Uh, uh, but being a legend has its downside. Uh, I um, went into a poster session a meeting or two ago and uh, met a young lady who had a very nice poster and I complimented her on it. And about an hour later, I bumped into her supervisor, and her supervisor said, Mary was really pleased. She said, Don Mackay came and talked to me about my poster, said nice things about it, and you know he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, while well, this is getting set up, uh, my title is The Joy of Fugacity. Fugacity the concept of fugacity has brought me a lot of joy over the years. I've had a lot of fun doing it, and I'm still having fun. And uh, I want to try to convey to you this morning some of the uh, uh, satisfaction and pleasure that building these models has brought. Good. So, joy of fugacity. I um, am at Trent University. They don't pay me but because I'm retired, but I was at the University of Toronto for about 30 years as well. Um, brief outline. I'm going to tell you a little bit about fugacity, for those of you who have forgotten, and then talk about fugacity partitioning in a multimedia world, and fugacity in the real world, bioaccumulation in food webs, fugacity and toxicity, and then the process of hazard and risk assessment, and then what I believe are some new frontiers for fugacity. Uh, all respectable organisms, including you, have two parents, and fugacity shares that benefit. The two parents, or groups of parents, are the pioneering chemical experimentalists going back to Antoine Lavoisier. They eventually introduced the concept of partial pressure, which applies, of course, in the vapor phase, but also to liquid and solid phases as well. So you can think of partial pressure as a criterion of interphase equilibrium. Uh, there's also, in parallel, a group of pioneering chemical thermodynamicists, and in particular, Gibbs and Lewis, and in recent days, John Prausnitz. You can journey from the second law of thermodynamics through concepts like entropy and free energies to chemical potential and then to fugacity. And it was Lewis in 1901 who coined the term fugacity. And fugacity is a thermodynamically rigorous criterion of interphase equilibrium. So the benefit that fugacity has is easily understood. It's just partial pressure for most environmental situations, but it has a very reputable thermodynamic parentage. Chemical potential, on the other hand, hasn't got that dual parent uh, quality. Uh, it's therefore more difficult to understand and less convenient to use. And 
Here's my hero, Antoine Lavoisier, the, fa the, the father of chemistry, and his wife, Marie Pauls. And J. Willard Gibbs and G. N. Lewis, who are really the fathers of fugacity. So just a few words about the physical chemistry that we're going to look at. You can write down Raoult's law, Dalton's law, and you can show that the concentration of a substance in a phase is proportional to the partial pressure or the fugacity, and that proportionality constant is a quantity called Z. With rather strange units of moles per cubic meter pascal, and it's actually the reciprocal of the molar volume of the solvent times the activity coefficient of the substance in solution and the saturation vapor pressure of the liquid state substance. So Z is actually a capacity of the phase for chemical, and we use it to relate concentrations to fugacity. But that is as difficult as it gets. There is a snag, though. In order to calculate the molar volume of a solvent, you need to know its molecular weight. So if I ask you, what is the molecular weight of a trout, you're in trouble, and you cannot do that. So you've got to ad adopt a dodge, which is, in using this equation, obtain an empirical or predicted partition coefficient, which is the ratio of two concentrations, the fugacities cancel, and it's the ratio of two Z values. So you can leapfrog from one phase to another using Z values. You can also rewrite all the equations for reactions, for interphase mass transfer, and so on, in terms of fugacity, and express a rate in terms of what we call a D value. So what we're doing is using three tools, fugacity, Z, and D, and that enables us to build models with fugacity. There, there is a myth that fugacity only applies under equilibrium conditions. It doesn't. It can apply under non-equilibrium conditions. I was trained as a chemical engineer, and I worked for a while in the petrochemical industry, and I did interphase uh, equilibrium calculations as occur in distillation columns and things like that. And I knew a fair amount about the properties of hydrocarbons. And when I became interested in environmental science, it struck me that there is an enormous variation in partition coefficients, such as air water, octanol water, and octanol air had not been invented at that time. These Change, these are factors of about 10 to the power 10 or 12. This must be reflected in an enormous difference in the Z values, and it must in turn be reflected in an enormous difference in environmental fate. So I set about trying to figure out how I could express these differences in physical chemical properties in terms of environmental fate. And I wrote this uh, paper back in 1979. My hair was a different color, but I've still got it. <laughs> and the idea, I said, was let's take a, a unit world, say a kilometer square containing air, water, soil, sediment, fish, aerosol particles, whatever you like, and work out the volumes of these compartments and the Z values, and then we can do various calculations and figure out how a chemical will be distributed in this system. So I, I wrote up this paper, submitted it to es and t and the reviews came back, nonsense, waste of time, do not publish. Um, Gary Sposito had exactly the same experience. And actually, I think that kind of novel ideas are almost doomed to be rejected um, because they don't fit into the regular run-of-the-mill uh, publication. I was very, very fortunate. Russ Christman, who was the editor, said uh, it's been rejected, but I think you may have something useful there. So get in touch with Stan Miller, who was the managing editor, and rewrite it a bit, give it a sexy title, and we'll publish it and see what happens. So I'm eternally grateful to Russ Christman for that. Uh, thing. So this was what uh, we published. 
And I suggested maybe three levels of calculation. The first one is a very simple level one. We have our unit world, work out the volumes, work out the Z values, and we ask the question, if we put in M moles of chemical, where will it go? And the equation is very simple. You work out the fugacity, then the concentrations, and so on. Um, and you get a, a diagram like this. Now, I love these mass balance diagrams, and you'll be sick of them by the end of this presentation. But it shows where the chemical is going to partition. This is pyrene, and most of it is in soil. A little bit in air, some in aerosols, some, a lot, quite a lot in sediment, and so on. And as you go through a spectrum of chemicals that vary enormously in properties, these percentages and distributions change enormously. And this starts to give you a familiarity with the chemical. The trouble with level one is it doesn't contain any reactions or flows. We move to level two, we introduce these reactions, flows, and now it's easier if we introduce a constant input and try to figure out what are the losses that will occur at a steady state situation where input equals output. This is sort of chemical engineering reactor kinetics of the type that John Feinfeld talked about tomorrow, uh, yesterday, but very much simpler. Uh, and the equation is actually very simple. But what this tells you is which loss processes are important. So there's a level two diagram for pyrene, and we introduce chemical, it establishes equilibrium. A fair amount leaves in the vapor phase. Most of it degrades in the soil, despite the fact that the half-life in soil is very much longer than the half-life in air. And that's because most of the chemical is in the soil and is susceptible to that slow reaction. This gives you an interesting quantity, and that is the residence time or persistence of the chemical in the system. Persistence is an incredibly important property of a chemical in the environment because it relates the input rate to the mass inventory of chemical in the environment and therefore to all the concentrations to all the exposures and all the effects. So there is rightly a focus on persistent chemicals, especially, for example, the organochlorines. The problem with level two is it contains equilibrium assumptions. And we don't live in an equilibrium world, so what we have to do is start to look at interphase intercompartment transport processes. And we introduce that and we end up with n simultaneous equations where n is the number of compartments. And the maths is, is very, very simple. And this is the kind of diagram you get. You introduce pyrene into the air and this is where it goes. And you get a persistence from this. You can introduce it into water, and you get a different distribution. The, all the processes change in relative importance, and the persistence changes. So the impact of a chemical very much depends on how you introduce it to the environment, and that affects the persistence as well. So we, we have great fun looking at all these level one, two, three diagrams. Um, the advantage to those of you who are in the academic world is you can take a class of 50 students and you can assign each one a different chemical so that they don't collaborate too much and ask them to go through level one, two, and even four calculations and do a little bit of toxicity assessment. And uh, this makes... Uh, this introduces them to the concepts of phase equilibrium, of reactions, of advection, of interphase transport, and exposure and effects. So that's what I did for many years. Now, a commercial break. These models are very simple, quite crude, really, but they need reliable parameter values. Where do we get them? Well, uh, I, I wrote this uh, book 
uh, describing a fugacity approach, uh, that's the second edition, um, a Chinese colleague wanted to translate it into Chinese, uh, and I agreed. We had a squabble with the uh, publisher who wanted all kinds of money up front for the copyright and so on. So to sweeten the deal, I agreed to uh, forego all royalties on the Chinese edition. Big mistake. <laughs> I, I should have, you know, there's a lot of Chinese. Um, uh, but it's fascinating to see uh, diagrams with all the uh, Chinese uh, symbols. Uh, we gathered and processed a lot of data on the partition coefficients, rate <coughs> constants of chemicals, and th that ended up as a series of handbooks and a CD-ROM. And increasingly, we're forced to rely on estimation methods because governments don't like paying people to measure solubilities and vapor pressures and important parameters. They much prefer to estimate them. And it's a very hazardous business, but uh, Bob Bortling and I tried to put together a compilation of methods. And, uh, my last effort will be a collaboration with Louis Thibodeau on environmental mass transfer coefficients. All the process, air water exchange, sediment water, vegetation air, vegetation soil, and so on. And we're, we have 20 chapters work, uh, on this. The publication is supposed to be early next year. One of our models that is widely used is the so-called EQC, or equilibrium criterion model, and it combines all the models, an area of about 100,000 square kilometers, which is about the area of Ohio, and we can put a population in in order to calculate human exposures, as I'll discuss later. That's a fairly dense uh, population, but it, it's not unreasonable. Uh, New Jersey, I think, has 400 per square kilometer. So there's EQC. Um, my colleagues at Trent, Eva Webster in particular, have done a great job putting this level one model together, and then you just press on a button and it converts it into level two, and you press on an another button and you get level three. So this enables you to explore how different chemicals behave. And it is quite widely used in risk assessment. Now, this is all very well, but are these models realistic? Well, we spend a lot of effort applying fugacity models to real environments, and these are some of the situations. And this is essentially an attempt to validate the approach and bring credibility to the models. Um, another mass balance diagram. I got a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction out of looking at these mass balance diagrams. And this is a very simplified version of the PCB mass balance in Lake Ontario about 1985. This contains enormously important information. There's the Niagara River contributing a lot. Uh, local emissions are not very much. There is a lot of atmospheric deposition. But all this material that goes into the lake, most of it ends up in the sediment because of the very high sedimentation rate. But quite a lot is coming back. Burial. Uh, to inaccessible sediments is a very important process. Reactions are not very important. And it turns out that volatilization is also important. So you get in trouble if, trying to calculate the contribution of the atmosphere to the contamination of, the, of Lake Ontario because there's very active transport in both directions. Sometimes the chemical is going up in a net sector and sometimes it's going down and not very much actually goes out the St. Lawrence River. So Lake Ontario is a kind of holding tank. And William of Ockham, of course, is a patron saint of simple models. He was a real awkward character, but he essentially said, don't make things any more complicated than you have to. And uh, I uh, firmly believe that. So what we've done is applied these models at various scales. For example, um, there's Hamilton Harbor or other contaminated site at the extreme west end of Lake Ontario. 
Lake Ontario itself, the whole Great Lakes Basin, and in fact, the, the collaboration we had with Berkeley, the BETR or better model of North America. And you can use this to figure out things such as how much of uh, toxaphene applied in the cotton belt of the US finds its way to the Great Lakes or to the Arctic. So these are the kind of questions you can address. And of course, we go to the better world model and you can go to more detailed models, in this case of uh, 288 regions. And of course, the Global Circulation Meteorological Oceanographic Community goes to models with an enormous number of compartments, and they're computationally very, very intensive. So I, I, I'm convinced there's a need to go from simple models all the way to complicated models, or uh, and uh, you get different information from each. Simple models are very easy to interpret. This is Frank Vania's uh, latitudinal model, with global pop, in which he's explored chemical space. This is log octal water partition coefficient against log octal air partition coefficient. All the chemicals lie somewhere in this space. These ones are the flyers, the volatiles that move through the atmosphere. These are the swimmers, substances like beta HCH, which tend to go in the ocean, and others that just tend to get stuck. So this is uh, very useful for identifying the potential of a chemical to move in different ways on our planet. And this diagram attempts to uh, summarize it, we've got transport going in both directions at all latitudes. We have atmospheric transport, we have oceanic transport. Some substances are very mobile, some are relatively immobile. Every chemical has its own character, its own set of behavior. Now, bioconcentration. If there is one area of environmental science that fugacity is very useful for it is bioconcentration. And I was very fortunate again to be associated with uh, Brock Neely, who was with the Dow Chemical Company, uh, the late Brock Neely, regrettably, uh, and he had done some. It was puzzling to the early um, biologists and chemists that if you took a a little fish and put it in water with a concentration of say DDT of one part, the fish would acquire a concentration maybe a million times that, bioconcentration. And it was puzzling to them uh, what was going on here. If you look at this through the lens of fugacity, there is no puzzle at all. Fish for a substance like DDT have a Z value which is something like a million times that of water. So what is happening is the fish is coming to equifugacity with the water. And that is the phenomenon of bioconcentration. And it's controlled by the lipid content of the fish, by the octanol water partition coefficient, because we think that octanol and lipid are much the same as solvents. That is, they have equal Z values. So, uh, that's uh, bioconcentration. But fish get chemical from dietary uptake as well as respiratory uptake. And I thought for many years uh, this didn't really matter because uh, eventually the fish would come to the same fugacity as the water or its food. So bioaccumulation involves uptake from both water and food. And to a thermodynamicist, the fugacity in the fish should be somewhere between these two values. In fact, measurements showed that the fish fugacity overshoots the food fugacity, often by a considerable amount. And that is very puzzling. It's like taking a bucket of water at 20 degrees Celsius 
taking a stone at zero degrees Celsius, throwing the stone into the bucket and measuring its temperature, and eventually the stone measures 30 degrees Celsius. That shouldn't happen. Um, what is happening is answered in the following way. If we ask the question, why are some locations very high in environmental concentration of contaminants? Well, there are two phenomena uh, fundamentally. There is what I call solvent switching. If a chemical moves at equal fugacity from a phase of low Z value to one of high Z value, then the concentration increases, but the fugacity is the same. There's nothing very exotic here. But there's also solvent depletion. Here, chemical concentration and fugacity increase because there is a loss of solvent. Let me give you an example from analytical chemistry. Take a liter of water, one nanogram of PCB, the fugacity is maybe 10 nanopascals. Extract with some methylene chloride, the extract concentration will go up by a factor of 100 as a result of solvent switching, um, but the fugacity is still 10. Then evaporate it to 1 ml. What is going to happen is both the concentration and fugacity increase as a result of solvent depletion. So these are two very distinct um, processes. And this is what is happening in biomagnification. The chemical is mainly associated with the lipids in food. You digest lipids in order to get energy by hydrolyzing them in the gut. The lipid solvent is depleted, so the fugacity in the gut increases, and this drives the chemical into the organism. So in the process of conversion of food to feces, there's a loss of mass, there's a decrease in the Z value, an increase in fugacity, and an impaired ability to expel chemical. So if you want to avoid this, you've got to eat lots of all bran and things like that in order to improve your loss process. Uh, but solvent depletion occurs in other places. For example, when snow picks up chemical by sorption to the ice interface in the atmosphere uh, and lands on the uh, surface of the, the ter terrestrial surface, it then starts going through a metamorphosis which reduces its area and becomes more granular. This results in a, effectively a loss of solvent. The solvent in this case is the surface area and you have an increase in fugacity. The same thing happens when you have organic matter falling to the bottom of a lake and that organic matter um, degrades as a result of microbial or other conversion processes. Long distance migration of birds is another example. A bird builds up its lipid content and then starts to fly 5,000 kilometers. It uses a lot of lipid in that process. The fugacity must increase as it goes on and so on. So this is a, these processes can be counterintuitive and therefore great fun. So biomagnification uh, is a rather important process. Fish are lucky. They can lose a lot of chemical by respiration. And the maximum biomagnification factor, that's the ratio of concentration organism to the concentration of the food, is usually somewhere about 3 to 10. Uh, be warned, mammals like you don't breathe water, you breathe air. And air is not at all efficient at getting rid of substances like PCBs. As a result, your maximum biomagnification can factor can be up to about a factor of 100. And this is why humans, birds, top predators, especially mammals, air respiring organisms are so much at risk. And these are some biomagnific maximum biomagnification factor estimates from Frank Bobas. 
up. Birds and marine mammals are right up there. These are the sentinels we've got to look for for adverse effects. And uh, Theo Coburn's crocodiles are probably somewhere in here as well. So more mass balance diagram. I get a lot of satisfaction putting these mass balance diagrams together for a fish, just showing the relative importance of all the processes, the residence time in the fish, and so on. And when you go to mammals, it becomes even better. More processes to look at. And of course, the next step is to go from single organism models to multiple organism or food web models. And there is, of course, because of magnification, a potential to increase concentrations as you go up the food web. And the top predators are most vulnerable, birds, mammals, snakes, seals, whales, bears, and so on and so forth. If you look at these food webs in terms of concentrations, the results are difficult to interpret because lipid contents vary a lot. If you look at them in terms of fugacity, through the lens of fugacity, it becomes somewhat clearer. And this is a calculation of a pesticide we've been doing recently. The fugacity, this is in picopascals, if the water is about one, sediment's a little bit higher, plankton's a bit lower because it's growing, zooplankton are a bit higher because they eat plankton, Benthic invertebrates are pretty much in equilibrium with the sediment. But once you get into forage fish A and B with different diets, if fugacity begins to increase, and then piscivorous fish that live in a diet of other fish, they are even higher. And if we were to put birds in there or fish-eating mammals like otter or mink, it would go up to something like 20. So this shows very clearly how chemicals trans are transferred in food webs. A few words about fugacity and toxicity. Um, Theo yesterday talked a little bit about the dose makes a poison concept. Uh, Paracelsus is allegedly the father of this. But more recently, 1939, uh, Ferguson, who was a chemist working for ICI in England, uh, wrote a paper saying that chemical potential drives the toxicity of narcotic chemicals. Um, rather than the circumenvironmental concentration. And the reason he was interested in this was that he was assessing the relative efficacy of fumigants. And what he found was that different vapors had different fumigant properties, and it depended very much on the vapor pressure of the chemical. So he argued it is chemical potential in the circumenvironmental uh, environment that matters, it is not concentration. And he applied this to narcotics or for, uh, for baseline toxicity. Basically, he was trying to find gases which were very good as fumigants. And this is quite important because probably about 75% of the 100,000 or so chemicals of commerce are just narcotic. That is, they probably don't have any specific biochemical uh, mechanism of toxicity. So fugacity is really mole fraction times activity coefficient times the saturation vapor pressure of the liquid substance. This group in here, X gamma, is activity, and it equals 1 when the substance achieves saturation. We can use activity as a criterion of equilibrium in our fugacity models if we want. We just have to redefine the Z values and the D values a little. And activity is simply fugacity divided by the saturation vapor pressure of the liquid state chemical. 
So if you produce a fugacity model, you calculate all kinds of fugacities. Normally, we would also convert them to concentration, but you can convert them into activities as well. And it is observed that narcosis occurs at an activity round about 0 0.01. That is, one hundredth of saturation causes lethality for these substances. If you have a substance which is a narcotic and is a selective toxicant, it is toxic at a much lower concentration, a much lower activity, say a factor of 10. If you can estimate that number, then you can estimate the activity of concern. So we can use fugacity models to go all the way from chemical properties to environmental fate, to bioaccumulation, to exposure, to activity, and finally to estimate the proxi proximity to toxic effect level. So this is a sort of long and toxic road, and this is really the business of risk assessment. And what we advocate for assessing hazard and risk is to define a unit world. It can be real or it can be evaluative. And often it doesn't matter very much. You define the chemical properties, select an input rate of chemical. It can be a unit rate, one mole per hour, or an actual rate. And you calculate using the models, the distribution, the concentrations, the persistence, and through food webs, and you can express toxic potency as a multiple of narcosis using activity. And then you can deduce hazard and risk assessment <coughs> factors and exposure rates. And this is our so-called radar model, which looks at fate in the environment and in agricultural natural food webs and eventually human impact. And we try to calculate what we call a hazard assessment factor, which is an intensive property. And those of you who can remember your physical chemistry, intensive properties are independent of the quantity of chemical involved. You just put one mole per hour unit uh, emission rate, and it's the ratio of the activity or the fugacity in the most vulnerable species or the species of interest to the level causing toxicity in that species. And then for risk assessment, you simply replace the one mole per hour by the actual moles per hour. And this gives you a predicted concentration as the concentration causing toxicity. The remarkable thing when you do this is that the risk assessment factor, that is the ratio of the concentration of the chemical to the concentration that's going to cause a problem is fortunately usually very low. But it, there is a whole population of chemicals for which these concentrations are 10 to the minus 6 to about 10 to the minus 12 of the toxic level. There is no conceivable way that these chemicals can exert any harm. So even going through a very, very simple um, assessment process can lead to the conclusion that of 100,000 chemicals, probably about 70,000 needn't be concern, of concern, but you've got to go through the process of assessing all of them in order to reach that conclusion. These ones are the ones of greatest concern, the persistent organic pollutants, the ones that come to the top. Uh, so this is another old dead guy who I admire, Aristotle, and he should be in charge of risk assessment and regulatory regulatory agencies. He says, a mark of an educated mind is to set to rest, satisfied with the degree of precision which the nature of the subject permits, and not seek an exactness where only an approximation of the truth is possible. 
With uh, environmental chemicals, I believe we have uh, enormous difficulties in calculating accurate numbers, but it doesn't matter a lot of the time because an approximation is quite adequate. So the implication for regulators is that society is demanding we evaluate all chemicals of commerce. And the, the European Union is marching down that road at enormous expense. Uh, and the chemical community, ACS and others, really should be a very vital part of this. It's not actually such a difficult task. You can do it approximately and get a, an answer. And if you're, an, you're uncomfortable with the answer, you go back and refine it in an iterative way. The most difficult data to get are usage and discharge data. Probably even more difficult than toxicity information. And I have to believe the vast majority of chemicals are innocuous and little simple uh, fugacity models can help. Let me end by speculating on the future. Um, five new frontiers. Uh, nanoparticles. I don't know much about nanoparticles, but they seem to be the hot topic. I think there is a need to model nanoparticles. And I don't know if it can be done, and I don't know if fugacity models can do it. If nanoparticles have equilibrium partition coefficients, it should be possible. Uh, and I've seen some data that indicate that this may be the case. I, I tried to get some money to do this, but failed miserably. But uh, maybe some of you know the answer to this question. Let me know afterwards. Uh, Multi-species chemicals are also very important ionizing substances or mercury. And we've been devising what we think is a very simple and effective way of handling these chemicals using what we call a multiplier method. We write all equations for one of the components and then we just piggyback the other chemicals on it. And it seems to work. And it's been applied very successfully to mercury in a number of environments. And the beauty is that if you can make an assumption as to the ratio of the mercury species, you don't have to know the kinetics of conversion. Um, a unit world which fascinates me is my body. And all kinds of strange things go on in there. But for a persistent chemical, the fugacities in my blood and various organs and so on must be fairly constant. So you can put together a unit world in which you compartmentalize the body and calculate the distribution uh, and uh, the inputs, the outputs, the fate. And of course, this is done by uh, pharmacologists, but mainly from the point of view of drug efficacy and design. But it's invaluable, I think, also for in environmental contaminants. If we can go from intake of a contaminant, like bisphenol A, to where it goes in the body, this is vital information. Uh, new animal species, uh, I find it fascinating that we have uh, on this planet many interesting species. Some, many of them are important, they're vulnerable, they're politically sexy, they do bizarre things during their lives, they taste good, or they're food for things that taste good, or they may be good biomonitors. And building fugacity models of these animals is great fun. And these are just a few of them. And we've also become interested in biovector transport. That is, contaminants are transported in considerable quantities and in high concentrations in specific locations, for example, in spawning salmon. Bears that eat salmon that have come up to spawn have much higher PCB concentrations than bears that don't. And that, that is a, a fascinating process. 
And then there is the final frontier. This is much more important and potentially profitable. And being of Scottish origin, profitable uh, ranks high in my thinking. Uh, and the fate of chemicals in the environment. And this is a whole new unit world, so I'm going to tell you finally about this unit world. And there it is. It is the oral and nasal cavity. When you eat gourmet food or a fine, drink a fine wine or a single malt scotch whiskey, you get great satisfaction. It tastes good. Your tongue is not really a very good tasting device. It only senses four blunt tastes. Where the action takes place is in your olfactory um, bulb up there. But what is happening is when you ha drink a beautiful Chardonnay from California, like the essential ingredients are evaporating, going up through your nasal pass uh, passages and uh, hitting the olfactory bulb. And that is what's giving you pleasure from drinking wine or whiskey or food. This must be driven by fugacity. So if I am able to compile a fugacity model showing how different chemicals move within this cavity, I have the potential to enhance the movement of the desirable chemicals and retard the movement of the undesirable chemicals. And this means tweaking the ingredients of the food or the ingredients of the wine or the whiskey. And of course, this is done by chefs or uh, people who run vineyards or whiskey distilleries, but it's done in a very crude way. It's a trial and error. We'll add a touch of this and see if it helps. There is potential, I believe, to develop fugacity models to do this. And if I'm successful in doing this, I will become very, very rich and I have long enough to ha achieve that goal. So what I've done this morning is tried to convey to you some of the joys I've obtained from playing with fugacity. It's uh, easily understood. It's very convenient, and it is, I think, invaluable for assessing the environmental fate and effects of chemicals, and it's lots of fun. And let me end by thanking a multitude of people who worked with me in this, and especially um, a group uh, Athens, Georgia, the EPA lab there that I became associated with in the early days. George Bachman, Sam Karikoff, that Susan spoke so touchingly about yesterday, Dave Brown, Dick Zepp, um, Ray Lassiter, um, Larry Burns, who regrettably died quite recently. Um, the whole idea essentially came from them and uh, I'm immensely grateful to them for that. So thank you very much.